My name is Alina Kutsko and I'm director of the Globsec Policy Institute. The case for the enhancement of European defense is resounding. However, European defense needs NATO and will not be credible without NATO at its core. In light of the increasing rivalry between great and emerging powers and the change in nature of security, neither Europe nor the US can afford to go it alone. The ultimate goal of European defense should not be the denatoization of Europe, but rather a Europeanization of NATO that strengthens the Atlantic Alliance. The rationale for moving forward is self-explanatory. Prosperous democracies must be capable of adequately protecting themselves and their citizens from external threats. Security cannot be fully subcontracted even to a staunch and reliable ally. The more European defense in NATO, the more NATO will defend Europeans. Furthermore, the transatlantic alliance needs to engage the broader and political and technological West from around the world, including partners in the Asia-Pacific region and Latin America. European defense will need to be linked to the world. Globsec European Security Initiative is our flagship initiative that aims to critically analyze the current state of development of European defense capabilities and put forward a strategic vision of European defense in light of this context. What is a feasible and desirable level of ambition of European defense integration? What measures can be taken to deliver tangible results? We offer answers to these questions and much more within the initiative and are looking forward to working with you on refining them further. Good afternoon to all guests. My name is Alex Martin and I'm the head of Globsec Brussels office. I would like to welcome you all to the third day of Globsec 2020 digital stage. I'm also pleased to be joined today by a fantastic panel with whom I will debate the issue of resilience and to what extent we are witnessing a game-changing moment in how we understand resilience and whether or not resilience is becoming a new premium feature or a new kind of asset in a COVID or post-COVID-19 world. I will discuss today with Philippe Messensier, Global Chair, Public Affairs and Hill and Knowlton Strategies here in Brussels. Maithre Seth Herman, Founder and CEO of Facultas Media in London. Joshua Polcher, Analyst in the Strategic Foresight Unit, Office of the Secretary General of the OECD in Paris. And David Earnshaw, Associate Vice President for Public Policy Europe and Canada at Merck Sharp and Dom here based out of Belgium as well. And I would like to kickstart this conversation by asking my guests, what is resilience? Is it just a buzzword that we have seen floating around in May and April? Is it a catch all world? Or if not, just help me unpack it. How do we define it from where you currently stand and why should we care about it? And maybe we start with you, Philip. Hello everybody and thank you, Alex, for having me today. Uh, Tall order, uh, what we understand by resilience. When, when you reach out to me um, on that issue, of course, I went straight to my browser and searched for the word um, to pick up you know, uh, the definition. I decided to pick up the definition that was offered by the uh, Merriam-Webster dictionary, an ability to, rec to recover or to adjust uh, from misfortune or change. I would perhaps add uh, that in my view, resilience is all about preparedness to buttress your ability to operate um, despite challenges. It's not something you do just once or uh, definitely achieve. I think it's uh, both a mindset, a way of looking at things and acting accordingly. And as uh, Joshua, who's on our panel, uh, rightly recently pointed on our uh, LinkedIn post, it's an ongoing process of awareness, self-criticism and action. It's about 
business continuity, where I stand from, which is basically from the corporate world, uh, but not just. It um, should be seen really as a basic part of any business's competitive advantage matrix. Its um, ability to adapt, to adjust quickly and effectively to a major change of um, either circumstances or, or disruption. But it should also really uh, be about contingency planning, preparedness again. Um, which takes us nicely back to Joshua's post and the permanent uh, thought process that it implies. It is, uh, of course, about mitigating impact, supporting business continuity, but it's also about ensuring that uh, uh, a business is able to bounce back more easily after a crisis because it has options uh, which have been prepared. Because resilience should be uh, business critical, in my view, uh, for corporates, it's something that should be squarely sitting um, at the top of uh, any organization, whether it's a CEO or a COO. Uh, when today it's often the remit when I'm looking at um, you know, the people I'm talking to, of the, the CSO, the chief security officer. And while there's clearly uh, a security or a process dimension to having um, a resilience policy in place, I would argue that uh, resilience is much more holistic um, as a concept than just security and therefore requires a much more general approach looking at an entire uh, business and its processes. You've asked briefly about uh, some of the key challenges and I think this is exactly where we often hit the wall. Uh, resilience is usually seen as something within the realm of uh, the CSO's function. Uh, well, it is all about preparing for something that may never happen. Uh, it takes time. You need to focus on foresight, risk assessment strategies. Um, it also takes money, both um, often in short supply, uh, for something that may never happen, right? So uh, the approach that often followed uh, today um, is uh, often focus on you know, disaster preparedness rather than a, a way of thinking, an approach to have the tool and the processes in place to face something which is unpredicted but not unpredictable. Thank you. I will get back on the funding and on the money that needs to, to get into it. But I want to, I want to go to, to Maitre. And Maitre, you have worked both with the corporate sector, but also with the government, also as a former co-chair of Most uh, Powerful Women Summit. Um, did you discuss the issue of resilience uh, with your counterparts? Uh, you're also based out of UK, um, and there are quite some, some, some concerns with regards to the bouncing back of the country um, amid um, COVID-19. So um, I would be happy to, to hear your thoughts in that regard. I think it's interesting, right? Resilience, the first time I ever heard of it, of the word in terms of a business context was back in 2009, uh, pretty much around the time when the world was trying to grapple with the after, uh, aftermath of Lehman collapse. Um, and it was in a very small, it was in a smaller context. And Philip is absolutely right that it was in the context of how do you tackle a crisis that may come the next time around. And people used to talk about the new normal in those days. I think the, the concept of what we're seeing today is a concept that a, a handful of companies that I've been speaking to over the last 10 years have brought about the concept of the next normal. Everyone is concerned not about a new normal, but the fact that every year there's going to be a new crisis. It's going to be unpredictable. We just don't know what it's going to be. This time around, we've been hit by two. It's a health crisis and it's an economic crisis. How do you deal with that? It's global in its nature and the speed of it is huge and it's impacting disproportionately people um, who would be vulnerable, that we thought we were helping and they've been forgotten. And a lot of the points about resilience that Philippe brings about in certain companies and certain organizations and in certain governments has been that of being siloed, being with the chief security officer. But the successful companies uh, over the last 10 years and the ones that are actually doing rather well um, through this crisis have been companies where the entire C-suite has bricked up on resilience and made it a core part of strategy. And it's really about openness and the ability to change um, and the ability to change culture, have a war chest, um, have a diversified um, portfolio that in terms of both customers and supply chains, all of that built into just the psyche of the organization to say, hey, ho, we don't know what's coming up next. So we're going to try to be resilient no matter what the next normal is. The one thing I will say is that 
looking at it from a perspective of the most vulnerable or the, the communities that get affected the most, it would be women. And we've heard an, a lot of talk about resilience when it comes to both organizations, being companies or government, where women are going to get left behind. And you've got to remember with the 400 million full-time job losses we're expecting to see this year alone across the world, you've got a disproportionate number of women that are going to get impacted because a number of governments, number of companies have not thought about resilience. They're not thinking in the long term about how those pay gaps and also the gender inequality increases is going to actually have a long-term effect. Now, the ones that are doing it know that turbulent times means scenario planning, means resilient, means the ability to bounce back no matter what happens next. So the context of resilience for me is forward planning no matter what scenario arises. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense and uh, I will follow up also on, on the issue of um, most vulnerable groups and who has the responsibility for, for it at the end of the day. And I want to move to you, Josh, because from where you stand in Paris, the OSCD is looking at resilience and also the other financial institutions consider resilience as an indicator for uh, giving loans, for giving aid, uh, for how the countries are, are ranked and uh, contrasted against each other. So uh, what's what's new at the OECD when it comes to resilience these days and how do you guys look at it uh, in the COVID-19 world? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And uh, I would just preface it by saying that my role is in the strategic foresight unit. So I come to the discipline of resil resilience from a slightly different angle. But I should say there is extensive work underway at the OECD on the topic of uh, systemic threats and systemic resilience with a number of leading partners and directorates. And a lot of that takes place under the umbrella of the New Approaches to Economic Challenges program, which in 2019 published a paper on systemic risk and the importance of resilience as a concept uh, in recovery and adaptation in the event of serious adverse events. And this year has also published a paper on systemic risk in the light of the coronavirus crisis. So a lot of this work actually foreshadowed the situation that we're in, and uh, that's available on the OECD website and coronavirus hub. Um, so uh, our, our practice in strategic foresight is a little bit different. Um, so the reason we do strategic foresight is to make better strategy. And resilience is not necessarily a strategy in itself, but it can be part of the overall strategy. Um, but if we take the definition of resilience put forward in the New Approaches to Economic Challenges papers, that it's a system's ability to prepare, absorb, recover, and adapt in the event of a disruption, then strategic foresight is indispensable to resilience. So think of a very well-known camera maker that failed to adapt in the face of big disruptions in its, in its industry. Um, I think you all know who I'm talking about. Our ability to absorb and adapt to new realities depends on our ability to understand what's going on and to make sense of what is emerging all around us. And it's often the case that organizations fail to demonstrate resilience because they are blindsided or caught unaware of what's really going on around them. And foresight allows us to make sense of what's going on around us today and the futures that are emerging, and therefore hopefully see the weaknesses in our resilience that we might otherwise have missed. Thank you. That's a that's a very very important point that you brought up. That r resilience is connected to to the capacity to foresee what will come next. Um, be that uh, a black swan uh, or something that we know is right around the corner, like climate change. Um, and um, it's it's very important to have the the uh, overall understanding and awareness. Uh, when we are looking at the at the resilience and capabilities building. Um, 
Dave, you have heard the definition from the OECD, uh, the prepare, prepare, absorb, recover, and, and adapt. And uh, Maitre also mentioned that um, it needs to be a business culture around uh, resilience. And the sector you are in has been kind of at the forefront of what has happened since, since the outbreak of COVID-19. So how are things uh, in your sector and in your uh, company, for example, how do you look at resilience and how do you prepare for uh, what's coming next? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting discussion. I actually I, I started looking at this. Uh, I didn't look at the dictionary first, but I started thinking about the COVID era that we're, we're living in. And I'm quite pessimistic about the COVID era um, and following Maitre's idea of the next normal. I, I, I do tend to think that we're going to live with COVID for a good many years, regardless of how quickly a vaccine is produced. Uh, it's not going to be about developing a vaccine. It's also going to be about manufacturing it and delivering it to 8 billion people. And if if you look at the news of this week about the eradication of polio in Africa, how long have we had a polio vaccine? Uh, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? And only this week have we eradicated polio from, from the continent of Africa. So I think we're, we're in this next normal for a good many years, and if not decades. And I know that's a very pessimistic place to, to start. But associated with that, we're obviously living, therefore, in an era in an age of tremendous uncertainty. Uh, the schools are going back next week. Some of the schools have already gone back in parts of Europe. Will the schools all be, will the pupils still be at school across Europe by December? Who knows? Uh, what will be the situation of employment in, in the leading economies of the OECD countries by Christmas? How many people will be unemployed in Germany, France, the United Kingdom, the United States by Christmas? What is the future of Kurzarbeit um, and, fur and furloughing in, in the UK? All of these are questions that, that we don't know the answer to. So in that kind of an era, I think resilience takes on a whole new set of definitions and, and meanings. If we look at um, the differences in mortality um, in, in the last six months, I think something stands out, which is that those countries which tested early, did lockdowns quickly, um, had lockdowns which were compliant, which were not chaotic which were not politicized all of those issues led to all of those that that uh, capacity of management led to lower mortality um, similarly government communications the quality of the communications led to better mortality figures so against that background re um, resilience becomes something about the capacity of governments and the capacity of organizations to develop coherent policy and to implement it quickly. So to put it very simply, muddling through is, is not going to work. Um, it's about the quality of planning. It's, a, it's about the quality of forward planning and implementation. And I think that's what, what resilience is going to mean in, the, in this era of uncertainty. The ability of organizations to identify where they need to be. I think Maitre called it forward planning to do the forward planning and then to implement it in a coherent way. Um, and I, I mean, in, in the United Kingdom at the moment, there's lots of examples of, of where this is not happening, uh, if, if I may say. Um, whereas in other countries in, in Europe, perhaps Germany would be an example of, of, of a much better management of the uncertainty that, that we're currently living, living through. So I would, I'd say that resilience is about that kind of concept. It's about the planning and the implementation and the coherence of policy. Thanks, David. That's, uh, that's a very, uh, indeed, uh, comprehensive way of looking at it. Uh, but you did bring up the two examples um, that are rather opposite, uh, if I may say, the UK and, and, and Germany. And to, to have uh, forward planning, but also coherence and quick implementation um, requires a lot. And of course, there are challenges. So if you could go back to what Philip already uh, started bringing, the, the challenges of um, having this uh, all planned out and, and ready to go. What would be your 
out of your, your head now brainstorming with us, what would be the top three challenges, for example, for governments and companies to, to have proper planning, quick implementation, and of course, a 360 degree view? So is that to me? It is to you. <laughs> Yeah. So the challenges well, in, in the implementation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's a big question, Alex. Um, where shall we start? Well, I, I think one of the things that I think has also become very apparent this week, and if we look at the example of, uh, maybe again, maybe it's a bad example, but, but our world is full of bad examples at the moment rather than good ones. If we look at the case of Phil Hogan, I think one of the, one of the factors is going to be, that's going to be important is what I call the elite public equality. Um, and maybe we've called it solidarity until now. But um, I think elite public equality is a better way of, of looking at it. In the era of COVID, our political elites and our corporate elites need to change their behavior or, or at least have a kind of behavior which is um, more and more equal with the behavior which is required of, of everyone. So there's going to be much more focus on e equality, I think. And if you look at, if you look at President von der Leyen's terse announcement when Phil Hogan resigned, um, it was a very short, simple, thank you very much and goodbye, um, which sort of indicates that we're all in this together. And so the big question following from that, the, 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 the really big question, is the extent to which that demand for elite public equality is going to lead to a reconsideration of equality and inequality in our society more broadly. And I, and I really think this is one of the interesting aspects of, of the COVID era. And of course, working in the healthcare sector, access to, to healthcare in Europe, generally speaking, is more or less equal. Um, and we, we, as a society in Europe, we, we believe we support the values of equality of access to, to healthcare in general. And, and I know there are lots of discussions we can have about that. But generally speaking, our continent is, is a continent that believes in the inequality of access to healthcare. But will that kind of thinking about equality become much more prevalent in other parts of the of, of society? Um, there's a tremendous amount of discussion, for example, about the, the K-shaped recovery. The K-shaped recovery is a frightening prospect where simply the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and, 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 and are far less resilient because of, because of the, the, their status, their income um, and, and access to commodities and, and and um, food and, and supplies, etc. So if we're going down the route of a K-shaped recovery, what does that mean for, for our societies? And I think uh, addressing that issue is going to be extremely important uh, going forward. Thank you, thank you, Dave. I'll go back to you, Maitre, because you brought up the, the gender inequality and the most vulnerable groups, and that's uh, connecting to, to what Dave said on, on the issue of inequality and how we will look at it from now on moving forward. Do you agree that this is one of the greatest challenges, or how do you see, how do we increase resilience? Um, what do we need? What are the secret ingredients? So I was talking about scenario planning, uh, which a number of very successful companies who seem to be showing really good earnings without having you know, laid off gazillion staff members are, are showing. You're absolutely right when it comes to the inequality bit, because this is a number that the UN Women put out literally a couple of days ago. It said 527 million women um, across the four hardest hit sectors, which is accommodation and food, real estate, uh, business administrative services, manufacturing and wholesale and retail are going to be adversely impacted. 70% of healthcare workers, which David would back me up on, uh, are women. They're going to be adversely impacted. They contribute about 37% of the global GDP, um, and let's not even count the unpaid work that they do. Now, think about what everyone's talking about. We don't know what's happening with the schools, even if kids go back to school, when are they coming back home? What's gonna happen with childcare? These women are getting laid off because they can't work. They can't go into work because while well, some countries will tell you, go into work uh, if you need to, um, for example, here, um, there is a pressure from 
companies that are not resilient, who are worried about their future, who are pushing their workers to come back because they don't see any other option because they didn't invest in digital transformation in time, for example. Those companies will have issues with their workforce and a lot of those workforces are going to be women who are going to land up back in their homes, not able to get a job because they're trying to balance everything. Um, when you when you think about the K-shaped recovery that David talked about, a lot of the a lot of the bottom um, rung of that K are going to be women, or are going to be people without the digital skills to transition because we didn't invest enough in those digital skills in the last ten years when we had the last recession. So we talked a lot about it, but we didn't do it in a speed that it should have been done. When you look at the company, I'm going to give you a great example of someone I look up to in terms of as a company that had done it right, which would be Salesforce. They have their earnings. They've had a pretty good run rate when it comes to keeping staff uh, on board. And they came up with a three uh, scenario situation and they planned for it. Um, which was the most optimistic scenario that everything goes right. We can do social distancing and every, everyone goes back to work somewhere around um, the fall. Then you have the second scenario that you get a smaller second wave, uh, requires another smaller lockdown, and then a vaccine is available by 2021, and everyone goes back towards the next normal. And the third scenario that they've planned for is the most pessimistic scenario, that the second wave is huge, that everyone goes into lockdown and it goes on indefinitely and there's no vaccine in 2021 and everything goes to hell. But this is a company that's planned for it and then planned its teams. They've done a lot of work internally for their teams to make sure that they can work remotely. They're doing that for their, for their customers. Now, can you do that as a government? I'm not so sure because governments, unlike companies, are not thinking long-term, at least in Western democracies. You're thinking about the next election cycle. Look at the US, right? Look at uh, what's going on in the UK. You have issues where if you want to be brave, that next election cycle is never going to let you be brave, which means somebody's going to fall behind and go into the bottom rung of that K recovery if it happens. Thank you. And thank you for uh, making it so easy for me to segue towards, towards Josh, because we heard the we, we saw examples of the companies uh, on the spectrum from no preparedness to a very uh, good way of looking forward. And indeed, on the governmental side, things are running slightly different. And in addition, we also seem to have a tendency on uh, looking at what has already occurred and prepare for that instead of looking forward and prepare uh, for the uncertainty and for everything that might be around the corner and we have no idea about. So how, how do we uh, merge those uh, two elements and how do we make sure that the governments are able actually to, to look at the resilience issue more from the foresight uh, perspective rather than what has already occurred? Yeah, I think this is a really good point that reliance on the past as a guide to how we're going to navigate the future is a, a very limited way of making policy and making strategy. And instead, we should be always finding ways to learn from the future, which sounds a strange thing because the future doesn't exist yet. It is still forming all around us. So the only way we can experience and learn from the future is to imagine it. And that's what strategic foresight is all about. And when we talk about scenario planning, the scenarios that we create are by definition imaginary and we create them in order to learn from them, not necessarily to correctly predict the future and get it right. But it's not just enough to do some scenario planning. And as I mentioned in, in the tweet that was quoted earlier, um, it, strategic foresight and resilience are not something you just do or ever definitively achieve. They, they're a constant process and they require embedding in an organization's culture, whether that's a government or a private sector organization or indeed any other organization that has a vision of success and uh, a strategy to achieve it. And uh, I, I pick up in that sense on Maitre's uh, comment about organizational culture, that if you're just delegating futures thinking or just delegating resilience and hoping that someone else will take care of it, 
then the chances are that the people who are really making the decisions that affect the direction that an organization is heading in um, may not be privy to that information or may not be able to take it into consideration. Um, and likewise, uh, F Philippe also talked about having resilience and foresight at the top of an organization or what has been referred to in Harvard Business Review as having an authorizing environment for strategic foresight um, to, to take place. So uh, I really agree with, the, with my fellow panelists that uh, foresight and resilience are a capacity that has to be constantly developed, whether that's in a government or in, a, in any other organization. Philip, I'm getting back to you because you have worked with both the private and the public sector for, for a, a good amount of time. And from your experience and from your interactions, uh, what is the private sector expecting from the government? From, from the government, if I could put it that way, um, moving forward or even now in, in times of Corona, as they do their own scenario planning, when we witness a complete um, a stop and, and blockage of our supply chains, when we were not able to deliver good A uh, from place A, or goods from place A to, to place B. So what are the expectations currently moving forward to help also the companies? Um, get better prepared for, for the risks of tomorrow. Uh, Alex, can I take a David Earnshaw on that one? That's a really big question. Um, <laughs> We're driving let, to let me try save and, the world here now. <laughs> let, let, let me try and uh, uh, take a, a couple of stab at it from, from different uh, point of views. I think if you're a business, and this is particularly difficult in a crisis, but what you want to try and have is actually consistency. Um, you know, what's really difficult is um, governments changing positions every week uh, or every other week. And we've seen this really consistently across the board uh, in Europe, in the US. Uh, and that goes back to um, the, the various points made about the forward planning, um, being, you know, having prepared for things. We, we're very clearly seeing today that um, uh, whether businesses or governments have done little planning, um, or have uh, disregarded the planning. I seem to remember there was a 2006 um, um, report by Michel Barnier, which uh, was all about, uh, you know, pandemic preparedness. And of course, that has lived in a, in a drawer for, you know, what, 13, 14 years. And suddenly everything was rediscovered. So, you know, consistency um, and probably being able to um, work uh, very closely together as partners, which... Um, Sounds sometimes like a, big, a, a bit of a pie in the sky, but um, it's about both the forward planning we talked about and the ability to communicate and exchange. Um, let me take a, a, a simple example, which is more corporate, but uh, where governments would have, could have um, uh, a really big role. Look at the entire 5G uh, discussion right now. Um, if, um, if you were a... Um, forward-looking business with um, resilience uh, at the heart of uh, what the company is doing, um, uh, being a C-suite issue, and of course being linked, um, as Josh mentioned, to you know, forward planning, you could uh, already six to nine months ago have uh, started um, uh, gaming the, the, the possibilities and where we are right now, both on you know, the way the U.S. has moved, um, the various uh, stages of those moves, and what it means um, for Europe. If you're a business, it's incredibly complicated. If you're a European business, having some sort of um, clarity and um, uh, longer-term vision from your own government or from European governments, um, and that may be a bit of wishful thinking. Nonetheless, a uh, long convoluted way of getting back to you, um, it's, both about, it's both consistency and uh, open communication channels, partnership, if you will, so that uh, there can be some sort of preparedness and, again, foresight planning um, uh, done uh, around those issues. Yes, uh, consistency. I don't know. I, I, Mike, I mentioned we're running against the electoral clock usually, so consistency is not necessarily always the, the driving force behind the, the, uh, the public policy, let's put it that way. We have a, a, a question from uh, the audience uh, from Andrei Matichak 
who asks, what does resilience mean for an, for an ordinary citizen? What should they ask from their governments, but also from businesses and how can they contribute? And I think that that's the third element, which is extraordinarily important to, to bring into the equation. It's not just about the governments, it's not just about the companies, but it's also about our own citizens and what's their role and their participation in, in um, uh, anticipating what will happen tomorrow and be ready to, to uh, absorb the shock and bounce back to a new type of normal. And uh, whoever one of you wants to pick this one up. Well, let me be provocative. Let me just make the conversation even more provoked. Um, and perhaps part of the answer to that, that problem that's been raised is that the limits of the European nation state have been demonstrated yet again that this, this the crisis has demonstrated that we can't address these kind of issues um, by definition a pandemic is way beyond uh, a single individual country and as Europeans I think it's very clear that we need to address this issue together and so it needs European capacity and European problem solving. The first couple of months of the crisis demonstrated that, that uh, Europe was very poor at addressing the problem. I think since, since May, June, uh, the European Union has got much better at it. And I think it's quite, it's quite significant just what the European Union has achieved since June, July in terms of addressing the crisis. However, a lot more needs to be done. And so that would be the first thing. But the second thing to add to that is also the need to get beyond Europe and thinking of Europe as 27 member states. If I look at, the, at my own sector, what would be really important to know is subnational data. What is happening in individual countries, in individual hospitals, without relying on national governments as gatekeepers? Um, national governments, of course, have got an interest in, in addressing the needs of their citizens and the needs of their populations. But if you look at it at a European level, when individual governments start making particular policy decisions such as stockpiling or closing frontiers, they're actually making the problem worse, potentially. So, for example, all of the vast majority of healthcare workers in Luxembourg live in France or Belgium. And so by closing the borders, you're actually making it terribly difficult for Luxembourg to, to manage its healthcare system. So those kind of things need both a European scale of, of, uh, of policy, but also a significant focus on a subnational level as well. Maitre, I get back to you because you also have a, a foot somehow in the United States, one also in, in South Asia. And is what uh, Dave just said about the need for subnational level also representative of other parts of the world, not just Europe? And also, is it actually possible uh, to acquire the type of data needed for, for this type of uh, policy making and policy thinking? Uh, we know that threats have no boundaries any longer. They have no nationalities. But at the end of the day, they impact us um, in a different way as we, we, we saw so far. So what, what's your take on also the, the, the citizens' role in, in the resilience or in increasing resilience process? Yeah, I'm what I think Teresa may call the, uh, the citizen of nowhere. Uh, the global citizen that belongs pretty much to nowhere, but to everywhere, right? Um, it, it's interesting. It, it, when you look at pandemics, that's one issue. You also have climate change that's going to be part and parcel of every single crisis that's going to come in the next couple of um, years, not even decades, right? But if you look at what's going on across the world, there's only so much that individuals can do if governments and businesses are not talking to each other. You can take personal responsibility for yourself. Um, you can train yourself, you can retrain, reskill, and constantly be skilling yourself to make sure that you can adapt to a changing work scenario. But as an individual, what else can you do? You can be responsible with your community. You can be participatory in your community. Um, beyond that, there's limited amounts that individuals can do, whether they're dealing with climate change, whether they're dealing with pandemics or economic downturns. It really does come back down to communication all the way through from the absolute uh, grassroots level all the way to the very, very top of whoever is leading the country. And that conversation, I find, especially in a crisis, 
falls down. It falls by the wayside because everyone is kind of reacting in a knee-jerk way to the crisis at the present and not really thinking about the future. So if you remember, there's a very famous thing that was going around Brussels um, between uh, 08, 09, and all the way up until probably 2015, where, you know, fix your roof when the sun is shining, fix your roof when the sun is shining. It's more than fixing the roof. It's, it's, it's about making sure that that roof is so secure that it never breaks. Now, the question is, how much can an individual do to contribute to that? There's a limited amount. You've got to take personal responsibility. But beyond that, it really does come back down to communication between leaderships. It is about leadership, leadership, leadership at the end of the day. Thank you for that. I want to, to follow up um, on your anecdote on fixing the roof and go to, to Josh, because one of the probably most accelerated uh, trend, if I could say, is this whole narrative of deglobalization, that COVID uh, lead us to deglobalize because we are too interconnected, too interdependent. Our global supply chains are too fragile. So we need to reshore, deshore, whatever else to make sure that we are more resilient. Um, how are you guys at the OECD looking at it? Is this something that you were worried about? How are we able, are we able to um, deglobalize uh, while on the other hand increase our resilience? I think the first thing to, to come back to is um, talking about uh, defending against uh, threats and disasters. It's, it's worth noting from a strategic foresight perspective that the future isn't just full of apocalyptic disasters that threaten the existence of humanity. And it's also full of opportunities to learn and grow. And, uh, you know, the OECD is founded on principles of uh, multilateralism and collaboration, which have enabled an enormous amount of, uh, of growth and prosperity over, over recent decades. And so those are not changes that need to be safeguarded against. They're, they're opportunities to take advantage of. Um, but just to come back to Andre's question, which is uh, which was about what all of this means for ordinary citizens and what they should demand from their governments, I think it's an interesting way to frame it. And just coming back to what Maitre was talking about in terms of individuals' limited capacity to bring about change and the importance of leadership, I absolutely agree. And of course, we do believe in the absolute paramount importance of experts and knowledge in, um, in dealing with uh, threats and turbulent circumstances. And of course, we believe in the power of policy to help humans come together and solve collective challenges. That said, leaders are humans too. They're, they are just individuals and uh, they, they are um, always uh, limited in the amount of knowledge that they can handle at any one time. And experts are also just humans who may specialize in a particular field. So when we talk about what we demand from our governments, I think it's also important to recognize that governments um, always have imperfect knowledge and are navigating turbulent times, just as all of us are. Strategic foresight offers some ways in which governments can maybe hope to navigate turbulent times in, um, in a more adept and effective way. Um, but I'd like to quote Riel Miller, who's the head of futures literacy at UNESCO, who um, during this COVID crisis has been drawing our attention to the fact that we need to let go of our delusions of being masters of the universe and capable of safeguarding against and uh, preventing every disruption and threat that may come our way. And a very important part of strategy is recognizing what you cannot change and finding other ways to face it. And scenario planning, particularly as a discipline of strategic foresight, allows us to separate ourselves from what we cannot change and control. Thank you, Josh. It seems that we are really at the end of this uh, fascinating discussion. Um, and I would like to invite each one of you in 30 seconds uh, to tell me whether or not resilience 
is the new type of asset uh, moving forward in terms of how we look at uh, future investments and where our political and economic capital will go on one hand. And secondly, imagine yourself in a position of advisor of someone very important with uh, decision-making capabilities. What would be the top three things that you would advise them to, to take into account to make sure that they are prepared for the, the risks of uh, tomorrow? Maybe I start with you, Philip, because you started, so. Good. Um, <laughs> let me, um, you know, 30 seconds, three, three points. Um, I'd like to go back to what you talk about deglobalization. Um, I think that uh, globalization has brought uh, the world uh, incredible uh, wealth. Um, and let people out of poverty, lifted people out of poverty. And I don't think that you will see a massive trend uh, necessarily back uh, from deglobalization. On the other hand, and these are things you need to be thinking about, the environmental pressure and concern that we are seeing means that um, circular economy is going to take a much more prominent role and there will be a balance between both of them. Um, what does it mean if you're a business? Some things will need to be reshored, not everything. And even what needs to be reshored, they will only be up to a certain level. So it will go back to, um, again, the planning and the preparedness. What do we need to have where? What makes sense uh, in terms of uh, being close to your um, customer, to your consumers, uh, to your, producer, your production sites, which will help you meet the societal expectations on uh, the environment, but also uh, being more resilient because you have uh, diversified, I think that's the word I would use, uh, your uh, supply chains um, and your, um, the routes that, that um, feed into uh, the various markets you have. Uh, and I will just finish by saying that, um, you know, COVID is an accelerator, but a lot of those trends were here way before. You can't understand uh, Europe's uh, drive for uh, digital sovereignty if you don't look at um, being more resilient and being more uh, empowered. Thank you, Philip. My tray, 30 seconds. <laughs> Well, think of it this way. No matter where you have your foot on the planet, you've got to do a couple of things. Invest uh, in digital transformation and reduce your debt. Make sure you have the money when the sun is shining. You have to have to do that. You have to be open to uh, changing the way you look at uncertainty and how you deal with them and invest in your people when the sun is shining so that you don't have to get rid of them and lose their trust. No matter whether you're a government or a company, you need to keep the trust of the people. So you have to change the way you look at uncertainty. And the most important thing is communicate honestly with your stakeholders, whoever they may be, your customers, whether they're your uh, voters, whether they are your shareholders. Communicate honestly about where you are, what you plan to do and take on board what they think as well because that honest communication changes everything. Thank you. Josh? I would say resilience, um, foresight and leadership depend on strong values and often we talk about system performance and efficiency and uh, the delivery of our policies whilst leaving implicit how do we know that we've got good performance and how do we know when we've achieved it how do we know what to prepare for in terms of the risks of tomorrow in other words why does it all matter so my final comment would be use the future to figure out what you value what matters to you as an organization or as a government and be guided by that thank you dave um, I think equality is going to be extremely important going forward and I think not only equality but addressing the needs of the vulnerable uh, so diversity inclusion uh, the whole black lives matter movement and everything associated with that these are the themes of the future second um, I think we all need to pay very much greater attention to what's happening in other environments in other countries as well as our own so interdependence and openness is going to become extremely important and finally and it may well be that i would say this wouldn't i but investment in health money and nobody's talked about money yet but money is going to be important and in particular investment bent on healthcare 
and in particular making sure that healthcare spending in, in parts of the world where healthcare spending has been low in the past should be much higher in the future. So an investment in health and a much greater equality in spending across Europe, for example. Thank you all for your valuable contributions and I would like to inform our audience that our next session will start momentarily and stay tuned as Tim Judah of The Economist will lead our next conversation on the trend, a more geopolitical EU amid growing instability in the neighborhood. Thank you so much for watching us. Globsec Bratislava Forum is the platform to tackle disruption and discuss solutions for better tomorrows. The basic theme of disruption is crucial because to me the issue is not whether it's climate change or whether it's the Chinese or the Russians or whatever, it's actually the concatenation, the mix of them all. And that's what I think is so valuable about this because it is a generalized conference. It allows us to see how all these problems combine. In Washington, we don't have enough exposure to what's happening